PenguinCon 2013, Saturday, 10, 11 a.m. LibreOffice workshop. You took a sum of money and threw it into a, an account. Be a bank account, stock account, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so, you know, on December 31st, you have that amount of money. And then over the following year, you earn interest at this specified rate. And you just keep doing that. So we've got the second year on December 31st, you throw another chunk of change in there. So it's very, very simple. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, what would this get you over time? And so we sort of show how that happens. And then uh, you can start manipulating um, how that works. Now, let's say you want to want to <coughs> do a scenario. Um, click on the tab down here. It says model. If I hold the control key, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a little black thing with a plus sign at the bottom. Plus means I am copying, I'm not moving. And then you see this little dot or something right there between them. Uh, all right. I've now got the second. I've just copied that entire page. And now I can come in and say, well, you know, what happens if I can get a better interest rate? That's only 5%. If I go into stocks, you know, I get, get a 10% rate of return each year. What does that do? Yeah, I know. This is a very simple model. And remember, the point of this is to learn spreadsheets, not, not to teach investing. Yeah. So it just more. So, for instance, in this in this case, uh, doubling the interest rate um, gave you actually a little more than double the return. So that was that was a pretty good thing to do. Say, okay, I, I like that. Um, let's do another one. One, let's say instead of modifying the interest rate, we modify the amount, we say um, uh, and that that just that's a simple doubling. So if instead of a thousand, it's two thousand every year, you double the amount over this time period. That's so I use this to demonstrate, for instance, that the rate of return is more important than how much you save over time. It's an interesting example. Now, doing it this way, um, and, and you know, for my corporate finance students, when I wanted them to investigate scenarios, you know, they would create a model that, you know, this is the cost of producing the product, uh, you know, here's what we can sell it for, and, you know, drag it out over a couple of years, and then it's like, okay, let's investigate the scenario. Just, you know, copy the change of the uh, and that's a big part of the, the power of what we can do with spreadsheets. Another thing that spreadsheets are really good for is graphing. Based on what 
if you looked at the data and said, what would make sense for this data? And it's a single set of time series data, so it just do this kind of graph. But I have a lot more control here. This chart wizard here says, well, here's other things you could choose. Now, you know, they made a pretty good choice here. Um, with different kind of data, I might want to do a you know, column chart. Um, or I could do yes, I could do a bar chart. Um, you know, a bar chart and a column chart are the same thing, only rotated 90 degrees. There's really no other difference. Do a pie chart, which would make absolutely no sense for this kind of data. <laughs> Um, area chart is actually what it did, um, and that's fine. And note, you could have multiple variables in here. Uh, you could do a line, let's just say scatter, bubble, okay. net, net diagram, uh, stock. Column in. Now, when I was teaching applied statistics, we would have gone into all of the reasons why you would use one rather than another. For every chart type, there's a reason for using that chart type. It depends on the kind of data that you have. So, if you had what we call qualitative data, something like a column, a bar, or a pie, you would make a lot of sense. So, you know, qualitative data is stuff that sorts into categories. So, you know, if you were, well, Mary is working on this political campaign. If you wanted to see, you know, people, how people sort it out in different neighborhoods. Something like a, a column, a bar, or a pie, you know, there's all residents in this neighborhood, and there's all residents in this neighborhood. <coughs> You might have five or six neighborhoods or whatever you have. Um, and then that would, that would be a good way that makes a lot of sense. When you have time series data, like I have here, something like a, a, an area or a line makes a lot of sense. Uh, scatter is good where you're not sure what, if any, relationship there is between the two sets of data. There's a, a technique called linear regression that allows you to do line fitting in data. And so a scatter diagram, you could sort of look at it and see, does this look at all like this relationship? It sort of starts in this place, ends up over there, so you think, yeah, there's kind of a line through the middle of that cloud. Or otherwise, it just looks like a big cloud. It doesn't look like this much of a relationship. Uh, so, you know, all of them have their uses. Now, you can refine this further as we go in. So we'll say we'll leave it at area. That was a good choice. And then it's saying, well, what data range? Well, we went from column A, number one, up here, to column B, um, 264. And you notice it inserted dollar signs there. so. These are, those references are fixed at this point. And it says, yeah, data series is in columns. So if I had data that was a set of rows, I could, you know, flip that around. And, uh, you know, first row, label, yeah. And uh, first column is a label, so it's just doing this down here. Is there a logarithmic function? Uh, yeah, I mean, at this point, it's simply looking at the data that's there. So what, if you want to do a logarithmic transform, you would apply a logarithmic function to the data and then graph the result of that. Okay. You can't have the graph um, automatically do it like you want to see the raw data in your spreadsheet, but you want the graph to be a log graph. I, don't think so, but. Add another column here. Yeah, I would just add, add another column and, and apply the function. Um, 
Then your data series, which is name, value. I could change it here if I wanted to, but it was just a label. Um, so I'll put in my chart elements. Is that what makes it like the dates are all kind of really hard to read? Can you have them read vertical instead of horizontal? See on the bottom? Yeah. Uh, Actually, could you change the format just to be year month? Probably make it more reading there. Or I, I'm not sure how to do that. Well, maybe maybe before doing the charting, you format the data. Okay, and it's formatting a different thing. One of the things I run into is that different pieces of this format in different ways. Uh, now, I, I mentioned uh, applying a function to data, so. Here, this is the function wizard, and right now the category is all, so it's showing all of the functionals that are available. There's a, a great many of them, uh, so you have several logarithmic functions. You were asking about logarithms. Mm -hmm. you use. You've got you know lookups, if thens. Uh, there, there's all sorts of stuff you can do here. Uh, sometimes you want to narrow it down and say, uh, you know, I want to use like a 
logical one and if you know to do a test and say if it matches the following criteria do this. Um, and what you're doing is you're you're basically creating uh, a function there and you have to fill in these specific values. So it says if and the first thing is a test. And so the test might be is the value in this column positive? So you go positive versus negative. Then, well, if it's positive, make the font black. If it's negative, make the font red. Um, and, and so on. Um, you can apply styles of the way this looks like it's actually assigning a value to the cell. Assigning the what? A value to the cell. In other words, you got your if, your condition, and if it's true, give it this value. If it's false, give it this value. I don't see where you can do a style on it. Um, okay, that, maybe that's in a different function, then, but I know that that's one of the things you can do with that. Uh, Testing, statistical is nice. Uh, I mean, you can do linear regressions in here if you want. That looks in each column at all of the different things that are there. And by default, it still has everything selected. But I could say I only want the people in this group. And we bring it down to that, or you know, I'm done, I could just say, now let's go back to all. Say, no, I what I want to do is I want to sort on uh, this. So it's just a way of doing some quick and dirty data analysis. Um, you know, if I were 
if I were interested in doing a lot with this, I would probably move it over to a database where I would have a lot more capabilities. But you can do a certain amount of this data analysis here, so I'm not going to say that you can't. And then I just got some blank sheets which we can ignore. So I'm going to drop this for now. One thing, if you have that the header, like from the GNP, yeah. when you have a ton of data going down, if you want your header to stay there so you can scroll the rest of the data, <coughs> um, what is that called? Freezing. Uh, freezing, yeah. Okay. So, now what I want to do is I want to talk about presentations. That's the next thing. So, just a question. How, yeah. Just how sophisticated do you think Calc is? If I want, had some sophisticated numerical type of analysis I wanted to do, is that an appropriate tool to pick up? And yes. Okay. It is. Uh, I, I mean, if if it's something that can be done with spreadsheets to begin with, Calc will will do a, a pretty good job. Where it will fall down is if you have macros that you wrote for Excel and you're trying to bring that in, you're going to have problems. I think Excel also is a little bit <coughs> better with the charts that you can do. Yeah. Does it, if you're going to do real sophisticated stuff, I would say that's when you start looking at a statistical package. Right. You know, something like, uh, well, SDSS would have been the one that I used. Does it do uh, what? Pivot tables? Pivot tables? Yeah. yeah. I just... It only gave me two hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the thing with Impress, um, and a lot of these programs, I like what they're doing here. Uh, Microsoft PowerPoint leads you in the path of unrighteousness. <laughs> because what they do is you open it up and the first thing they want you to do is, is pick your colors and your, your slide look and all of this kind of stuff. And that's not the right way to build a presentation. You need to just focus on content. Uh, some years ago, I didn't <coughs> show how old I am. Uh, I was reading a study might be a chronicle of higher ed. Um, someone was at an Eastern University and the uh, introductory uh, composition that all the freshmen had to take. And they had two different groups. One was word perfect for DOS, and the other was And if you remember word perfect for DOS, it was like you got a blank screen of a blinking person. That was it. I still have that um, in a virtual environment. I don't so um, they found something very interesting. They analyzed the, the, the papers that resulted. And the word perfect, so the students who used word perfect consistently had better papers than the ones who used Macintosh. And they thought, well, that's interesting. And they went back and they found there's no difference in the overall grade level. The students appeared to be the same. They came out of high school with similar grade point averages. They had similar um, college board scores. I, there wasn't, they couldn't find anything. And they finally came around to it, it's the software. And their hypothesis, and it makes some sense to me, is that with, with the Macintosh, Macintosh was the first graphical system, really. And so you opened up a word processor in, in Macintosh, and you had fonts to play with, and you know all these visual things. And word perfect for DOS, you didn't have any of that. You got a blank screen with a cursor. Start writing. And the net effect was that they wrote that because that's all they could do. <laughs> the program didn't let them do anything else. Well, now, do you know in that study if they uh, if the individuals chose the Macintosh on their own or if that was something assigned to them? No, they chose it. Okay, so it may have been that people who were inclined to be more concerned about appearance might have cho chosen the Mac and thus had 
orientated their papers toward something that the instructors were not grading them high on? Uh, well, that could be. Uh, and the, real, the point I'm making is if you start building a presentation by thinking about appearance, you're going to go off the rails. That should be the last thing you do. Uh, you should start, and, and I like the way it does it, it's, it gives you a title slide. slide. I got three bullet points on it. And I go to my next. And I just, you know, keep plugging along. Yeah, I can go through a whole presentation this way. Uh, I, I once taught a remote uh, economics class, so I did a full semester introductory economics class, where half of my students were in another state. It was done via compressed video. Uh, so it was, it was all virtual. 
And so everything was done with slide deck. Every class was a